baptisé « Jeux du Chac africain ». Pour une meilleure connaissance du patrimoine culturel de l'Afrique et de sa diaspora, des spécialistes africains, européens et américains présenteront la Wale sous tous ses aspects. Mathématiques, pédagogiques, historiques, informatiques, artistiques. À Wale, une présence africaine en Facebook Live sous le patronage de l'UNESCO le 31 mars de 14h à 17h et le 1er avril de 14h à 16h en partenariat avec RFI. Madame, Monsieur, bonjour. Toutes nos excuses pour les, 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 le, le gros retard que nous avons pris. Euh, et bon, les, ce sont les problèmes techniques, les aléas du, du live. Euh, Recording je, in je progress. Suis que, je suis sûre que vous comprendrez. Euh, donc, euh, alors, on va commencer avec beaucoup de retard. Euh, vraiment, encore une fois, toutes nos excuses. La parole est à Madame Gonéfal, commissaire de la saison Africa 2020. Madame Gonéfal, c'est à vous. Bonjour à, à, à tous et à toutes. Je me joins à Marie pour euh, les excuses concernant, concernant ces aléas techniques. Euh, je suis un peu à la bourre, comme on dit, puisque euh, je dois inaugurer un autre forum sur la COVID qui commence dans pas longtemps. Euh, je voulais juste remercier tous les participants et toutes les participantes à ce forum qui se déroule sur deux jours et qui est dans le cadre du temps fort, le sommet de septembre, le temps fort dédié au débat d'idées de la saison Africa 2020, euh, saison euh, exceptionnelle qui concerne l'intégralité du continent africain, qui a commencé le 1er décembre dernier et qui se déroule sur l'intégralité du territoire français y compris ultramarin, jusqu'à fin septembre, et qui est en fait axé sur l'innovation dans les arts, dans les sciences et dans l'entrepreneuriat. Et concernant ce sommet de septembre au titre étrange, il devait à l'origine se dérouler tout le mois de septembre, avant la Covid. Nous l'avons reprogrammé sur le mois de mars, mais il garde son nom et sa spécificité. Donc il y a une trentaine de forums et de conversations. Nous l'avons lancé ce, ce sommet depuis le musée du Quai Branly Jacques Chirac à Paris avec une remarquable leçon inaugurale du professeur Achille Bembe. Euh, nous arrivons sur la fin de, de cette aventure avec donc ce colloque sur la Wallée qui vraiment symbolise beaucoup de questions sur la saison. Elle est portée par 23 questions de société que sont la diffusion des connaissances, les réseaux sociaux, les innovations technologiques, la redistribution des ressources, les flux financiers, l'émancipation économique, l'histoire, la mémoire, les archives, la circulation des personnes, des idées et des biens, le territoire, les consciences et mouvements politiques et la citoyenneté. Ce colloque, pour celles et ceux qui nous écoutent, va vous transposer à travers l'espace, le temps et à travers l'histoire, euh, vers une formidable aventure qui a commencé il y a plusieurs siècles et qui concerne à la fois un aspect récréatif, un aspect de divertissement, mais également un aspect scientifique et de mathématiques. Et toutes les éminentes personnes qui participent à ce colloque pourront vous donner une des multiples facettes de ce jeu. Donc, je vous souhaite de bonnes discussions, d'inspirer, d'être inspiré, et euh, je vous dis euh, à bientôt et je dois malheureusement vous quitter et je vous remercie. Merci à vous, euh, Madame Gonéfal. Euh, la parole est maintenant à son Excellence, Monsieur Albertu, Albertus pardon, euh, Ao Chamoub, ambassadeur extraordinaire et plénitentionnaire de Namibie en France, délégué permanent de Namibie auprès de l'UNESCO et président du groupe africain UNESCO, de l'UNESCO. Uh, Merci. Merci beaucoup, euh, Madame Catier. Bienvenue en France. Je voudrais vous remercier de m'avoir donné cette occasion de faire quelques observations aujourd'hui au nom du groupe Afrique de l'UNESCO. En cette journée où nous célébrons un véritable trésor du patrimoine culturel africain, à savoir le jeu d'Awale. Alors, nous savons tous que l'histoire de l'Afrique est censée avoir commencé le jour où les Européens sont arrivés sur nos côtes. 
Au, avant l'arrivée des Européens, euh, l'Afrique était un continent sombre, euh, dénué de toute civilisation, que l'on disait peuplé de sauvages et de tribus incontrôlées qui s'entretuaient et qui vivaient au sommet des arbres. Hein en tout cas, c'est ce que l'on nous raconte. Jamais on ne nous raconte dans ce contexte une histoire d'innovation, de créativité, ni de progrès de l'esprit humain. Étant donné la façon dont, ce, depuis si longtemps, notre histoire est ainsi faussée, le présent colloque comble un vide important. Il nous rappelle le riche patrimoine qui est le nôtre, qui est celui du berceau des civilisations humaines. Permettez-moi de vous faire part de quelques éléments chiffrés relatif à notre présence sur le registre du patrimoine mondial. Je passerai ensuite à une proposition euh, concernant l'avenir du jeu d'Awale. Alors, au niveau mondial, sur le registre mondial, il existe aujourd'hui 1121 sites du patrimoine mondial. Ces sites se trouvent dans 167 États partis. 39 de ces sites sont transfrontaliers. Ce sont donc des sites partagés par plusieurs pays. Sur ces sites, 53% donc de, décembre, de ces 1121 sites hein, sont inscrits à la liste du patrimoine mondial en danger parce qu'ils sont menacés par de sérieux risques. Donc voilà le paysage mondial des sites du patrimoine mondial. Maintenant, regardons le paysage africain. Il n'y a que 137 sites du patrimoine mondial dans les 42 états partis africains. 89 de ces sites sont culturels, 42 sont des sites naturels et 6 sont des sites mixtes. Et ces 136, 136 sites africains représentent 12,22% du total des sites répertoriés au niveau mondial. Donc 12% seulement des sites du patrimoine mondial sont des sites africains. Sur ces sites, 22 sont inscrits sur la liste de patrimoine mondial en danger, ce qui signifie que 41% de nos sites, donc presque la moitié des sites africains, sont des sites en danger. Si euh, je peux me permettre de partager avec vous encore quelques chiffres, avec ces dix sites, l'Afrique du Sud accueille le plus grand nombre de biens du patrimoine mondial sur le continent africain, et l'Éthiopie et le Maroc ont chacun neuf sites du patrimoine mondial, neuf biens sur la liste du patrimoine mondial. La majorité des pays d'Afrique n'ont qu'un ou deux sites inscrits sur la liste. 11 des 53 États partis du continent africain n'ont aucun site du patrimoine mondial. Donc il y a 11 pays en Afrique qui n'ont rien sur la liste, rien du tout. Partageons pour euh, comparaison ces pays, donc les pays d'Afrique, le Burundi, les Comores, Djibouti, la, Guité, la Guinée équatoriale, la Guinée-Bissau, le Libéria, le Rwanda, Sao Tomé et Principe, Sierra Leone, le Soudan du Sud et Swatini. Mais maintenant, comparons, comparons avec une autre région, prenons la région européenne et voyons combien eux ont de sites. Eh bien, en Italie, il y a 55 sites. En Chine, bon, Quittons l'Europe. En Chine, il y en a 55. Revenons en Europe. En Espagne, il y en a 48. En France, 45. En Allemagne, 46. Allons en Inde, il y en a 38. Au Mexique, il y en a 35. Et au Royaume-Uni, Grande-Bretagne, Irlande du Nord, il y a 32 sites. Alors, pourquoi, pourquoi suis-je suis en train de partager avec vous cette statistique C'est bien pour en tirer une conclusion. Que l'Afrique et la diaspora africaine ont une formidable occasion de faire inscrire plus 
de notre patrimoine culturel, matériel et immatériel sur ces listes, de faire inscrire plus de ces artefacts sur le registre mondial. Et en ce qui concerne le jeu d'Awale, il me semble que nous sommes devant une opportunité unique de partager ce jeu qui est déjà partagé par de très nombreuses nations de notre continent. Et c'est une... C'est une sorte de lien entre nous. C'est quelque chose que nous avons en commun. Mais nous devons au monde de partager avec lui cet objet culturel si important qui mérite de faire partie du patrimoine mondial, des mathématiques, de la science, de l'éducation en Afrique et partout ailleurs. Donc, que convient-il de faire à l'avenir Je propose, en toute humilité, au présent symposium, que l'un des premiers résultats des présentes délibérations soit de lancer la procédure visant à faire inscrire notre jeu au registre du patrimoine mondial. Il y a de nombreux pays susceptibles de co-sponsoriser cette initiative et nous, le groupe Afrique de l'UNESCO, sont tout à fait en mesure, collectivement, d'ajouter notre voix à celle des pays individuellement. En conclusion, je voudrais rappeler que nous sommes le continent d'où vient la vie et qu'il paraît donc tout à fait logique que l'Afrique revendique le rôle central qui est le sien en termes de patrimoine culturel et intellectuel, en termes de richesse culturelle. Il faut que le monde sache que nous sommes un grand peuple, que nous possédons une sagesse et des connaissances séculaires. Conservons le jeu d'Awale pour les générations à venir et faisons entendre notre voix. Je vous souhaite deux journées riches et pleines d'informations. Et je vous remercie pour votre attention. Merci, M. La parole est maintenant à euh, Firmin, M. Firmin-Edouard Matoko, sous-directeur général de l'UNESCO pour la priorité Afrique et les relations extérieures. Merci. Euh, merci, euh, bonjour, euh, bon après-midi euh, tout le monde, euh, et excellence, mesdames et messieurs les ambassadeurs, euh, chers invités, chers participants. Euh, nous sommes heureux euh, ici à l'UNESCO d'accueillir, euh, même euh, en forme virtuelle, euh, ce colloque qui s'inscrit dans la saison Africa 2020, mais qui s'inscrit également dans tout le travail que l'UNESCO a réalisé, réalise depuis sa création pour promouvoir la diversité culturelle, pour promouvoir la créativité et pour promouvoir le savoir endogène. C'est donc une occasion pour nous ici, en tant qu'UNESCO, d'aussi dire combien nous sommes euh, attentif, nous serons attentifs aux résultats de ce colloque pendant ces deux jours, aux pistes que ce colloque pourra ouvrir pour promouvoir le jeu de la Wallée. Comme l'a si bien dit euh, l'ambassadeur, le, le président du groupe africain, l'Afrique a une histoire, l'Afrique a un trésor que nous avons tous le devoir de promouvoir. Euh, je vais tout de suite euh, aussi euh, remercier euh, Suzanne Diop, ancienne collègue, euh, responsable de la maison d'édition Présence africaine, et aussi euh, Martial Zebelinga, président du comité scientifique, cher ami, qui sont euh, à l'origine de ce, de ce colloque qui nous ont convaincus ici, pas seulement nous autres Africains, et je voudrais saluer la participation d'ambassadeurs et délégués permanents d'autres régions du monde qui se sont connectés pour suivre ce colloque, et ce qui montre bien l'intérêt de ce thème, l'intérêt de ce jeu qui va bien au-delà de, du continent africain. Le séminaire de ce jour porte sur la Wallée. Qu'est-ce que nous en savons de quoi s'agit-il Eh bien, nous aurons pendant ces deux jours, pour nous autres ignorants, certains d'entre nous, ou non praticiens, l'occasion d'apprendre davantage, de savoir et de comment 
il fonctionne aussi peut-être, hein, et de savoir également quelles sont les perspectives pour que ce jeu représente toute la diversité et la richesse euh, africaine. Euh, je ne serai pas long, je crois, comme de, pour cet après-midi. Je voudrais donc souhaiter à tous un bon colloque et de nouveau euh, euh, féliciter euh, euh, Suzanne pour cette, et son groupe pour cette initiative. Je vous remercie de votre attention. Merci. Merci, monsieur le directeur. La parole est maintenant à madame Suzanne Diop, directrice des éditions Présence africaine. Bon, merci. Euh, Excellence, mesdames, messieurs, chers amis. Je voudrais tout d'abord remercier Madame Gonéfal, commissaire générale de la saison Africa 2020, pour son adhésion précoce à ce projet qu'elle nous a aidé à concrétiser avec le soutien de l'Institut français et de l'Agence française de développement. J'exprime toute ma reconnaissance à son Excellence Monsieur Albertus Aouchamou, ambassadeur extraordinaire et plénipotentiaire de la République de Namibie en France, délégué permanent de Namibie auprès de l'UNESCO et président du groupe africain de l'UNESCO. Il nous a fait l'honneur de s'associer à ce programme et ce faisant, il donne à ce jeu à Wallet toute sa pertinence comme élément remarquable du patrimoine culturel africain. Je remercie Madame Audrey Azoulay, directrice générale de l'UNESCO, et Monsieur le Président de la Commission nationale française pour l'UNESCO pour l'octroi du patronage de l'UNESCO accordé à ce projet. J'adresse mes très chaleureux remerciements à Monsieur Firmin Edouard Matoko, sous-directeur général de l'UNESCO pour la priorité Afrique et les relations extérieures, car il a tout de suite accepté de nous accompagner dans l'organisation de ce colloque, en appuyant le patronage et en nous accordant un soutien technique et financier. Encore un grand merci. Un petit mention particulière à Madame Fouad-Boigny qui nous a rejoint parce qu'elle nous a aussi aidés pendant le, euh, la préparation de ce colloque, Madame Oufouet boigny qui est l'ambassadrice la, déléguée permanente euh, de Côte d'Ivoire euh, auprès de l'UNESCO. Euh, pour Présence africaine, l'idée de consacrer à la Wally un programme remonte à la fin des années euh, 90. Il s'agissait d'exhumer d'un relatif silence une des activités culturelles les plus dynamiques sur le continent africain et au-delà, à travers le monde. Il s'agissait aussi de percer euh, le mystère, au premier abord, de ce clavier qu'on appelle tablier, percé de douze trous circulaires, dans lesquels les joueurs jettent avec plus ou moins de rapidité ces gros noyaux, ces grosses graines, euh, dans le sens euh, contraire des aiguilles d'une montre. Il s'agissait de parler de ce jeu quasiment absent des médias mainstream et qui pourtant poursuit son existence, tournoi après tournoi, championnat après championnat, que ce soit au Togo, au Bénin, en Côte d'Ivoire, au Nigeria, en Éthiopie, au Cap Vert, en Gambie ou en France, en Espagne, au Royaume-Uni, en Suisse, au Kazakhstan ou encore aux États-Unis, à Cuba, à Antigua, comme en Arabie Saoudite. Lorsque le président Macron a décidé de lancer cette saison, dont le principe fondateur était d'inviter à regarder et comprendre le monde d'un point de vue africain, nous nous sommes dit que l'occasion était venue de pro proposer la Wallée, qui en vérité illustre ce principe, puisqu'en en appliquant les règles de ce jeu, on applique en fait une conception africaine d'un jeu de société. Nous l'avons donc proposé à Madame Gonéfal, commissaire générale de la saison Africa 2020, avec deux autres projets touchant euh, les bibliothèques et concernant les proverbes et dictons africains. Mais ce, de ces trois projets, c'est la Wallée qui a été retenue par le comité de programmation et nous nous en réjouissons. Nous nous en réjouissons parce que euh, parler de ce jeu permet de sortir de la vision habituelle des manifestations culturelles attribuées à l'Afrique, à savoir la musique, la danse, la peinture, la sculpture, la littérature, bref, ce qu'il est parfois convenu d'appeler les beaux-arts et les belles lettres. À vrai dire, tel que nous l'avions proposé au départ, le projet Awale de Présence africaine contenait, outre le colloque qui nous rassemble aujourd'hui, 
la participation d'une dizaine de villes françaises, outre-mer comprises, à des conférences suivies d'ateliers d'initiation euh, et l'organisation de tournois et de championnats pour les plus chevronnés. Le programme contenait aussi un concours de fabrication de tabliers avec un cahier des charges établi suivant des critères tant techniques qu'esthétiques et il comprenait aussi la présentation dans une des villes choisies d'un awalé géant. De ce programme ambitieux, les circonstances ne nous ont permis que, et c'est déjà beaucoup, le maintien de ce colloque et de l'awalé géant. Cet awalé géant a été confié par la métropole de Toulouse et l'éducation nationale au lycée professionnel des métiers du bâtiment urbain vitry de Toulouse. Cet awalé, euh, ce lycée possède entre autres une section bac professionnel constructeur bois euh, ainsi qu'une section technique des métiers du, du spectacle. Alors, Ce sont les élèves de ces deux sections qui ont conçu euh, cet awalé géant Euh, qui ont conçu cet awalé géant, il est en bois de mon table et accompagné de panneaux explicatifs sur l'histoire du jeu, sur ses usages en mathématiques notamment. Ce bel objet doit être inauguré le 31 mai prochain au Quai des Savoirs de Toulouse et notre vœu sera donc exaucé et nous remercions les autorités euh, concernées ainsi que les élèves d'y avoir contribué. Je voudrais quand même revenir un tout petit peu en arrière pour dire que, enfin, en montrant certains, euh, certaines illustrations, que le jeu est connu, euh, circule un petit peu dans le monde entier. Euh, je ne sais pas si on peut montrer euh, les, euh, la vidéo de départ. Euh, C'est assez touchant de voir que on peut jouer à la Ouélé aussi bien euh, dans le sable en creusant des trous par terre que euh, euh, n'importe où, en fait. Et j'aurais bien voulu qu'on montre aussi ce jeune virtuose qui joue avec son papa dans le sable et que euh, on nous a autorisé à projeter. Peut-être que euh, j'aurai l'occasion de... Voilà, je trouve que c'est touchant. Euh, je voulais qu'on voit ça. Euh, Apparemment, c'est exactement, il doit avoir deux ou trois ans. Hein. Voilà. Euh, donc, euh, je voulais euh, euh, donc revenir au colloque lui-même qui nous réunit. Et nous avons sollicité M. Zebelinga, sociologue et économiste, membre du comité de rédaction de la revue Présence africaine, car il s'intéresse depuis longtemps au phénomène de la Wally. Euh, C'est lui qui a conçu les modalités euh, de euh, l'ordre du jour de ce colloque et il vous présentera lui-même ces modalités tout à l'heure. Et j'en je, profite pour le remercier chaleureusement. Euh, je pense que euh, ces travaux vont être d'un très, très grand intérêt. Les restrictions nous ont empêché de donner à ce colloque une plus grande étendue. Nous aurions voulu élargir le nombre des disciplines, notamment introduire le sujet de la Wallée dans l'économie, en tant qu'industrie culturelle et donner aussi à voir davantage de création artistique ou artisanale de l'objet. Euh, nous aurions souhaité aussi aborder le potentiel touristique de ce jeu en examinant la possibilité d'organiser des tournois à l'échelle sous-régionale et régionale du continent africain sur une base périodique comme c'est le cas pour les Jeux olympiques. Mais ce n'est que partie remise. Nous lançons donc aujourd'hui ce premier jalon tout en émettant le souhait que, euh, chemin faisant, la Wallée euh, pourra un jour figurer, tout comme le reggae de Jamaïque ou la rumba de Cuba, sur une liste du patrimoine immatériel. Pour finir, je voudrais dédier ce colloque à Wallée, une présence africaine, à Djibril Tamsirnian, qui vient de nous quitter le 8 mars dernier et qui, grâce entre autres à son livre « Sundiata », apporter à la connaissance de lecteurs du monde entier l'existence de l'épopée mandingue. Je voudrais dédier également ce colloque à Alion Diop, fondateur en 1947 de la revue Présence africaine, 
et en 1949 de la maison d'édition du même nom, promoteur infatigable de la reconnaissance des expressions culturelles de l'Afrique à travers le monde. Je vous remercie. Merci, Madame euh, la directrice. Nous finissons donc euh, cette introduction avec euh, Monsieur Martial Zebelinga, président du comité scientifique. Euh, donc, euh, c'est à vous. Désolé, j'ai fait exactement le contraire de ce que j'aurais dû faire. J'ai tout éteint au lieu de tout allumer. Je crois que c'est l'émotion. Euh, merci de me donner la parole. Euh, et je, je suis euh, vraiment ému et, et, et honoré par euh, euh, l'importance qui m'est accordée et puis qui est accordée au thème. Euh, je dois dire que le, le colloque aujourd'hui est un colloque pionnier. Et ce n'est pas simplement un colloque après un autre ou un colloque qui précède un autre. Il me semble bien que ce colloque s'inscrit dans une certaine nécessité. Euh, C'est un patrimoine, évidemment, africain dont on parle, un patrimoine qui existe au moins depuis plusieurs centaines d'années et sur lequel nous avons tendance, malheureusement, y compris nous africains, et à commencer par nous africains, à n'y jeter qu'un regard... Euh, de quelque chose qui serait mineur, un art mineur ou quelque chose de plutôt minoré, qui n'a pas eu en général euh, voix au chapitre quand il s'est agi des grandes manifestations culturelles ou institutionnelles africaines. C'est donc une double nécessité, à mon sens, de revenir sur cette pratique à la fois ludique, sociale, culturelle, qui renvoie autant à l'intangible, donc des règles, la façon de la, la, imaginer un jeu, imaginer des règles, imaginer un jeu de société, mais qui renvoie également au tangible. C'est-à-dire qu'on a avec euh, la Wale, qui peut s'appeler Ngola, qui peut s'appeler Awele, qui peut s'appeler Wuri, qui peut s'appeler Pao, par ailleurs, on a ce qu'on pourrait appeler un artefact culturel total, puisqu'on a à la fois un objet qui renvoie à l'esthétique et à l'art, un objet qui a des significations culturelles, des significations profanes, des significations rituelles aussi, euh, et un objet qui est aussi dans les grands débats contemporains, qu'il s'agisse de l'éducation et l'enseignement des mathématiques, ou alors qu'il s'agisse simplement de l'art africain qui se trouve dans les musées euh, occidentaux et qui est, euh, comme chacun le sait, euh, au cœur de grands débats et de grandes discussions. Et vous verrez que dans, les, dans de nombreux musées dans le monde, dans les musées qui sont en dehors de l'Afrique, vous allez retrouver des Awale et des formes particulières de l'Awale. Le colloque ne pouvait donc être qu'un colloque pluridisciplinaire, puisqu'il convoque nécessairement les philosophes, puisque le jeu a des règles de jeu, il y a une éthique qui se dégage de, de l'ensemble de, des variantes de jeux qu'on trouve en Afrique, il y a une conception du monde, quand vous prenez le tablier Dogon par exemple, le tablier Dogon est une figuration de l'arche de la création du monde. Euh, les anthropologues s'y retrouvent, les historiens devraient s'y retrouver, mais également les psychologues, les mathématiciens, on a donc un, on a un terrain qui est favorable à un ensemble de disciplines allant des humanités aux sciences dites pures. Humanities to uh, 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 sciences, and it can can only be pluridisciplinary uh, because, of course, uh, uh, players, organizers of tournaments, uh, they are more and more numerous in Africa and also in Europe, and um, we tended to forget. Uh, that uh, this game is still going on in the Caribbean, uh, uh, where uh, the game is called a Wari. Uh, there's, there have been tournaments for years, and uh, there are people who are uh, really uh, 
excited about this game and uh, uh, the men uh, women uh, they have played uh, uh, since uh, uh, their younger age so it's an additional african expression and i'm thinking about uh, Professor Yai, uh, uh, my father, I would have liked to ask him questions about the different languages of Awale because you play Awale and you also speak when you play Awale. And what you say, the words you say are important. We've used the, 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 the word Awale. Now, it's a, a sort of uh, a kind of uh, injustice because the, 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 the more um, the word which is uh, usually uh, used is mankala, uh, in, 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 in a rather Arabic word. And for an African game, we had to use an African word. This being said, there are several variations to these uh, games. Uh, you have the uh, 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 um, Sahelian uh, 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 variation uh, with uh, two rows of uh, six holes uh, and you have uh, another uh, variation with four uh, rows there are different uh, uh, variations uh, but the rules are more or less the same uh, the state of mind is also the same uh, how the uh, opponents uh, 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 play global c'est un c'est on le retrouve en Afrique mais il va traverser les océans avec les migrations africaines c'est donc un savoir qui va se développer en Afrique et en dehors de l'Afrique. C'est à la fois une pratique ludique comme une pratique culturelle, une pratique sociologique, parce qu'également dans certaines sociétés africaines, on ne joue pas de la même façon selon les âges, on ne joue pas de la même façon selon qu'on est euh, euh, jeune, jeune personne ou adulte, etc. Il y a donc une énorme richesse dans ce jeu que malheureusement le colloque ne pourra pas restituer dans son entièreté. Ce que nous ferons, par contre, c'est que nous allons organiser nos débats autour de panels qui seront des communications, un certain nombre de communications, et d'un autre côté, nous aurons euh, des tables rondes. Donc, euh, on va alterner entre des panels qui vont, où les communications vont se succéder, suivis d'interactions avec le grand public, et puis des panels qui seront euh, des échanges autour de joueurs, autour d'acteurs de la promotion de la Wallée, qui, eux aussi, ces échanges seront également suivis d'une interaction euh, avec le grand public. Donc, ce que nous allons commencer par faire, ça va être... Euh, Évidemment, euh, peut-être d'illustrer de, de, un peu nos, notre propos sur l'aspect global, l'aspect world history, comme on dit aujourd'hui, de la Wallée, comment il part d'Afrique et comment il continue de vivre en dehors de l'Afrique et comment il se déploie. Ça va être un mini-film qui a été proposé, qui a été réalisé d'ailleurs par l'anthropologue afro-américaine, euh, ma collègue au comité scientifique de l'UNESCO pour l'histoire générale de l'Afrique cette fois, Madame Sheila Walker, qui nous a fait euh, l'amitié de nous faire découvrir son, son sujet. Wari à travers les océans, Bénin, Afrique de l'Ouest, Antigua, euh, Caraïbes, Harlem, États-Unis. À travers l'Afrique, les hommes, les personnes jouent un jeu de stratégie mathématique sophistiqué qui est appelé dans certains endroits Wari. Ce jeu est l'un des nombreux éléments de leur culture que les Africains ont apporté avec eux aux Amériques. On joue encore au Wari dans les Caraïbes et surtout sur l'île d'Antigua. J'ai demandé au Premier ministre de me euh, citer une chose que les Africains à Antigua ont quelque chose de tangible qu'ils ont aujourd'hui et qu'ils ont apporté d'Afrique. Et une femme dans la foule a crié « Wari ». Uh, Jawara, uh, qui était professeur de mathématiques à Antigua, a apporté ses connaissances et ses compétences aux États-Unis. Il fait des tabliers de Wari et joue et apprend à jouer à ce jeu dans les rues de Harlem. Les gens d'Antigua 
pensent que le Wari est leur jeu. Et quelques-uns pensent même qu'aucun autre peuple sur Terre ne joue au Wari. Alors l'objectif du jeu est de capturer 25 graines du côté de votre adversaire. Alors pour jouer, vous prenez des graines dans n'importe quel trou de votre côté du tablier. Et choisissez un trou et il faut commencer à distribuer les graines. Oui, j'avais l'habitude de jouer lorsque j'étais enfant. Tout à fait. Mais c'est partout en Afrique, lorsque vous y allez, vous voyez les gens jouer dans les rues, c'est très courant. Euh, vous avez oublié comment jouer Vous voulez jouer Yes, of course. Ah, oui, vous l'avez fabriqué, oui, bien sûr. C'est un jeu de dénombrement. Tout le monde en Afrique joue à ce jeu qui est très intelligent. Antigua est le seul endroit où les joueurs sont enterrés avec un tablier. Lorsqu'ils meurent, ils s'assurent qu'ils emportent avec eux au paradis un de ces tabliers. Extrait de visage familier lieux inattendus, une diaspora africaine mondiale. Donc, merci au Sheila Walter encore une fois pour ce reportage qui nous permet de voir déjà la dispersion de ce jeu hein, d'Afrique vers les pays euh, afrodescendants. Et c'est vrai qu'on n'a pas encore, on n'a pas d'histoire de la Wallée. Il n'est pas possible aujourd'hui d'écrire une histoire de la Wallée, mais on a la possibilité de retrouver les grandes temporalités de la Wallée en retrouvant la Wallée où se trouvent les afro-descendants et en retrouvant leur migration à travers le temps. Même si on parle du 4e siècle, pour certains du 7e siècle, en Éthiopie, en Érythrée, etc. Certains disent qu'il aurait été connu aussi des Égyptiens à l'époque hellénistique, d'autres disent encore des Sumériens. On, il n'y a pas encore d'histoire réelle, il y a des bonnes raisons à cela. On peut donc comprendre à travers là où la Wallée se retrouve, dans ces formes africaines, on peut comprendre qu'il y a une profondeur historique suffisamment forte, en tout cas, à ce jeu. Euh, là, on va, nous allons écouter euh, une approche beaucoup plus philosophique qui va essayer de nous parler des valeurs, des valeurs dont la Wallée euh, peut être porteur et qu qu'est-ce qu que philosophiquement on peut en dire euh, avec le professeur Bonaventure Mbeuno, qui est professeur de philosophie à l'Université Omar Bongo de Libreville et qui est auteur d'un ouvrage sur la Wallée, l'Owani et le Songor deux jeux de calcul africain. Mesdames et messieurs, bonjour. Je partirai d'un vieil adage latin dans lequel vous me permettrez de changer un mot et qui servira de titre à mon intervention. Castigante, ludendo mores. Ainsi, l'un en face de, de l'autre, dans le corps de garde, deux joueurs s'affrontent sur un tablier de son. En effet, l'un après l'autre, il vide là où les graines d'une case mûrement choisie qu'il dispose successivement dans les cases suivantes selon le mouvement des aiguilles d'une montre. Au bout de plusieurs échanges où le bruit des graines qui tombent une à une dans les cases semble avoir établi une sorte de rythmique, soudain, l'un des deux joueurs effectue une prise dans le camp adverse, prise dont il dispose ensuite les graines définitivement acquises dans l'une des cases disposé au centre même de ce tablier. Bientôt, en réponse à cette prise, l'autre joueur engage une tactique qui lui permet à son tour d'effectuer une prise, voire une prise multiple. Cependant, de même que les timides lueurs de l'aurore annoncent la pleine lumière du jour, de même ici la succession des coups qui semblent découler de l'analyse des rapports de force en présence annonce la suite de la partie. Comme dans la vie, les coups et les contre-coups se succèdent. Ici, tout semble faire signe. D'abord, le tablier lui-même qui rappelle la cartographie du village avec ses deux rangées de cases et, de, et leurs habitants. Ensuite, la circulation et l'accumulation des graines, mais aussi les prises, qu'elles soient simples ou multiples, la case avec une graine orpheline, la case pleine et enfin les pièges. Dans la partie qui se déroule et qui consacrera bientôt le champion, nous croyons saisir dans la succession des échanges la relation de cause à effet qui fait qu'un coup en produit un autre. Ici, tout semble renvoyer à une sorte de spectacle caché, à une série d'événements et peut-être même au roman du monde et à l'aventure des hommes. En effet, la succession des coups et des évidences qu'elle organise vont peut-être au-delà de ce que nous croyons percevoir de prime abord. Et si le spectacle de la circulation des graines finalement donnait à voir l'exercice de la pensée en action et invité à une compréhension du système de valeurs implicites qu'il semble suggérer. 
La question mérite d'être posée. Dans l'éthique protestante et l'esprit du capitalisme, Max Weber, critiquant la conception matérialiste de l'histoire, a établi que ce ne sont pas les seuls intérêts économiques qui sont à l'origine du développement économique, mais aussi et surtout des faits à caractère culturel. Pour lui, je cite, « C'est parce que le travail dans le monde était seulement l'expression d'un effort dirigé vers un but transcendant, fin de citation, qu'a pu se réaliser jusqu'à son terme la rationalité économique. » Autrement dit, c'est l'esprit ascétique du protestantisme qui a permis d'organiser et de rationaliser le travail et la production afin d'enrichir la vie humaine. Cependant, Max Weber, en établissant cela, ne cherche pas à proposer une réponse unique à la causalité du capitalisme, mais plutôt en tant que sociologue de l'action, à comprendre le sens que les êtres humains donnent à leur conduite. Agissent-ils par conviction ou par calcul Tel est l'un des enjeux philosophiques que peut donner à penser le jeu du son groupe. Plus fondamentalement, il y a lieu de s'interroger dans le jeu comme dans les actions humaines sur la place qu'occupent le calcul et l'obligation, c'est-à-dire sur ce qu'il en est de la rationalité axiologique, elle qui unit stratégiquement les fins et les moyens. Doit-on l'assimiler à la seule rationalité instrumentale ou bien, finalement, ouvre-t-elle vers autre chose Dans la partie que nous avons commencé à décrire plus haut, avant de décéder ce qui s'y joue vraiment, il importe de mieux saisir comment elle se joue. Nous l'avons laissé entendre. Tout se passe autour d'un tablier rectangulaire organisé en deux camps opposés qui disposent chacun de sept cases. En phase initiale, chaque camp contient sept graines par case. La circulation successive de ces dernières, leur accumulation, les prises, l'obligation de nourrir l'adversaire, la nécessité de ne pas l'affamer, tout cela s'inscrit dans une démarche stratégique où ni le hasard ni la chance, aucune place, mais dont le but ultime est de gagner la partie, c'est-à-dire de capturer le plus grand nombre de graines en réussissant des actions tactiques, à savoir les pièges. Cependant, au moment même où s'affrontent les deux adversaires et surtout au moment où s'achève la partie, n'est-il pas possible, à l'instar de Sisyphe revenant sur son rocher, de contempler l'ensemble de la partie comme une suite d'actions pour essayer d'en dévoiler le sens et si donc tout, dans le jeu comme dans la vie, fait signe, n'y a-t-il pas lieu de s'interroger ici alors sur le sens même de la vie S'agit-il d'une simple collection d'instants ou d'autre chose Quelle vie mérite-t-elle d'être vécue Et pour quel type de bien Peut-on vivre comme si cela allait de soi Pour tout dire, on peut retenir du Songo quatre leçons, ou plutôt trois. La première, on la trouve dans la dimension proprement agonistique que traduit l'affrontement et que l'on retrouve lors des tournois à travers les invectives confrontation when we have tournaments and the and the criticism which they make of one another the opponents make of one another or does this agonistic dimension come from the technical dimension of the actual game in practice but the ultimate goal is quite prosaically to kill off the opponent that is to beat him and so assert one's superiority and one's own analysis one's own judgment built on the ability to learn from one's own errors and success stories but we need to look beyond this and perhaps we should question the processes which lead to accepting defeat and therefore the victory of the opponent because playing means playing well it's not just going along with simple choices or impulses but trying to optimize the moves and to block attacks made by the opponent The second lesson that we can deduce from this is the primary inequality, rules, relationships between humans, and that those who can win are those who can take on their responsibilities. Because if you can play a game, you can make choices, not just by taking into account all the houses in the game, their strong points and weak points, but also see the threats and opportunities. We are therefore dealing with a sort of limited rationality because it is uh, set in a certain context. So we know that there is meaning in each new stage of the game and each stage is the consequence of previous stages. In fact, the entire game occurs as if previous decisions laid out the path for future decisions and as, as if there were an interdependence of the different parts of the path. In such a context, thinking is not a synoptic process, 
but it is, first of all, being able to make calculations and deductions and establish relationships and links in successive moves. So the art of the game is based on the ability not just to work out how to move the seeds in the houses so that you can fill houses and get strong houses, but also, and most importantly, to establish relationships built on solidarity between houses, Obergam and perhaps even with the houses belonging to the opponent. So playing well means fair play. Learning fair play means playing with intelligence and with proper control of one's own impulses. In fact, the third and final lesson is truly a philosophical lesson, because what we can see in this game, it also makes us think about the very life itself. Um, we can see the game has meaning, and so, of course, life has meaning, and the task of the game or the task of life is the ability to redefine oneself over and over again. This means that each player chooses his moves and takes responsibility for them. Similarly, we must learn to live and follow thought processes. Living means being aware of one's finite existence and go, starting over and over again. It means uh, having disdain for any any passing action or th hopes, means accepting life as a human being, fleeing irresponsibility, which, would, uh, which comes from habit and which comes from any automatic thought, means taking the initiative again, because we must learn from what we observe, which is not what is seen by ordinary mortals. Because meaning comes from context, that's obvious. But then what is always obvious, starting with obvious matters which are in the primary epistemic areas, must be deconstructed and re redevised so that we can find the original intuition of games where we started. Castigat Rudendo Mores, playing games corrects mores. Microphone, please. Thank you, uh, Professor Mbeondo, for your brilliant presentation. So you brought up questions of rationality and the meaning of life that we can see through money, the important of, uh, importance of action and strategic action, and also it's a it's an area of knowledge, an epistemic area. This is an important concept. I would like to point out that Professor Mbeondo was referring to the uh, Awali version played in Gabon, which is called Songo. That's why he was talking about the Songo, and uh, his description of the game was not exactly what we found in Western Africa. And now we're going to uh, look at uh, Wale, Wale in the diaspora. We have Professor Luana Antunes, who is a Professor of Portuguese Literature and Education for Ethno-Racial Relations in the Federal University of Luiz Afro Brazilian Integration in, in Brazil. And she's going to uh, tell us about the history of Awali there, how it almost disappeared and how it's been revived in Brazil. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Greetings to all of you. I would like to thank a Présence Africaine. I would also like to thank the organizers of this symposium, Awali, an African Presence. I would like to thank Mr. Martial Zebelinga for this invitation, which uh, is giving me an opportunity to share with an audience my considerations on the teaching of Awali in Brazil strategies uh, against the epistemic side of knowledge held by the African population and its descendants. Brazil is a country which has the second largest black population in the world after Nigeria. We have historical, cultural and effective bonds with the African continent, bonds which are incarnated in the body of our population as well as in the cultural body inhabited by the memory of Afro-Brazilians, individual as well as collective memory. When we asked the Afro-Brazilian population about the presence of Awali as a game, or other games of the Mancala family originating from the African continent in Brazil, the answer carries a memory vacuum. 
The African Brazilian population doesn't know this game. Yet the game is widespread throughout the African uh, continent. And it did, in fact, arrive in Brazil through history, through the Atlantic slave trade, through the history also of those who returned to Africa and their descendants, such as the Aguda population of the Gulf of Benin. More recent research on the origin of Awali in Brazil quote uh, the pioneer work of Manuel Raimundo Quirino, an abolitionist and an intellectual of Bahia, who described in 1916 a traditional African game called Ayu. This game consisted in, I'm quoting Quirino here, a piece of board with 12 hollowed out parts where the ayu were placed and where they were removed. And these ayus were small, dense, lead-colored fruits, which originated from Africa. The author then noted that the game was played by Africans. And these Africans were porters, people who specialized in carrying goods and carrying persons. According to Quirino, these men came from Benin, Nigeria, and the Gulf of Guinea. Expert Elisio Maris Santos Silva, who studied uh, Angolan games in Brazil, tells us that this game was not played on a wooden board, that it was played in pits that were dug out of the ground, which explains the absence of vestigial artifacts. Anyway, there is another significant factor to explain the absence of Awali in the collective memory of Afro-Brazilians. During colonial times and during Republican times in Brazil, there were criminal laws in this country laws which persecuted and which repressed the expression of African and Afro-Brazilian cultures. There, was, there were especially punitive uh, incidents on capoeira, which is both a game and a martial art, batucada and dancing, but also religious expression and cult of ancestors and other areas. So, this, the first criminal code of 1830 and the penal code of 1890 were laws which criminalized African culture and Afro-Brazilian culture. So in this way, we, we realize where lie the roots of the narcissistic covenant of whiteness, which values the cultural, scientific, and physical body of the white world, and which imposes cultural whitewashing. Anchored to this covenant, the epistemicide engineered against Afro-Brazilian and African knowledge is still going on in Brazil, even in our days. Against this project to assassinate the African and Afro-Brazilian cultural body, we are conscious of a renaissance of the practice of Awale in Brazil in the 21st century. The promulgation of Bill 10636 in 2003 amended the basic laws and directives uh, in, of national education. This bill made compulsory the teaching of Afro-Brazilian and African culture and history at all levels in education. This law caused a real change in educational public policy, particularly in the state of Sao Paulo. In 2010, the Center of Education for Ethno-Racial 
the Center of, for Ethno-Racial Education, was founded in Sao Paulo by the municipal uh, authorities. And one of its main projects is the teaching of Awale at the very crux of knowledge triggered by this game. Ethno-mathematics, arts, history, geography, African culture. So, like the baobab tree, Awali is our African seed, and today the seed is blooming in schools. Thanks to the undefeatable strength of the children, of youth, and of our elders who did not forget, our steps come away. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Luana Antun, for taking us to Brazil, for taking us to one of the old and yet contemporary uh, travels of our league. We're going to change continent again. We're going to return to Europe with a player, a passionate player of Awali, but who is also an author, somebody who has given a great deal of thought to board games and particularly African games. In fact, he wrote Awali, the African seed game. He's going to tell us of his thoughts on the comparison between Awali, chess, and the game of Go. Before I let go of the mic, my virtual mic, that it would be fair to say that Awali is African chess, but for Africans, chess is the Awali of Europeans. You could say the same thing about Go in Asia from an, an African perspective. I would like to thank Pascal Resset for the presentation which he was kind enough to send us. Go, chess, and Awali. Over the centuries, these three major games have developed and prospered in our world. They are the game of Go in Asia, the game of chess in the West, and the game of Awali in Africa. And each of these games is intimately tied to its culture of origin or its culture of development. And it's uh, the game carries the voice of its region of origin in the world of games. And each of these games reflects the history, geography, psychology, and mythology of the continents and of the peoples where it was born and where it prospered. In fact, it's remarkable to see that even to this day, and in spite of globalization, the very best Go players tend to remain Asian, Chinese, Korean, or Japanese, that the best chess players are largely Westerners, and that the Africans remain the virtuosi of Awali. These three games are also very beautiful artifacts. The finest Go games are carved, selected and carved out of the very finest wood. The chess games are masterpieces of carving and marquetry. They can fetch extremely high prices. As for the games of Awali, well, they're beautifully sculpted items and fit for museums. Now, these games also are very different. Look at the game of Go. It's played on a board which contains 19 by 19 lines, so 361 crosses with white and black pebbles. And this game is a representation of the empire of the middle of ancient China. It illustrates the confrontation between the yin and the yang, and it's most of all a game about sharing space and conquering territory. Now, the game of chess is played on a board of 64 black and white squares with black and white pieces, and there is a strict hierarchy between... La cour de, des temps anciens, c'est le jeu de la destruction de l'autre, de la prise du roi, mais c'est aussi le jeu du traité de paix en cas de partie nulle, ce qui arrive très souvent. Le jeu d'Awale, lui, se joue sur un tablier de, de bois comprenant 12 cases creuses avec 48 graines. C'est le jeu de semailles, de la récolte, du partage, de la capture, de l'échange. C'est un jeu de combinaison basé sur... C'est un jeu de combination et c'est tout basé sur l'accumulant et le distribuant. Let's look at age. Historians agree that Go goes back 2,500 years, which makes it an extremely ancient game. The game originated in China, from where it traveled to Japan, where it culminated in the 16th century under the shoguns. Chess dates from 6th or 7th century India or Persia, and it was perfected and transported by the Arabs. 
And then it was adopted in Europe, where it uh, reached the pinnacle of its rules in the 17th century, particularly with the arrival of the piece called The Queen. Awali's origin and age are not known, but it must be a very old game. And one can only marvel at the varieties of rules and shapes and names from one country to another, from an island to another. It has traveled, particularly carried on the ships. Let's just look at the combinations, the various combinations and, and the number of moves possible. Here, Awali and Chess are quite close. Go is different. It took Go very many years to be covered entirely by the algorithms of uh, artificial intelligence. It only was only completely covered by AlphaGo just a few years ago. Now, one thing that is very specific to each of these games is the attitude of the players, particularly with regards to time. Go matches, particularly in Japan, are ceremonial in scope. They're practically religious, at least there's the atmosphere of a, of, of a cult, and time is slow. In chess, competitions at the uh, international level are also characterized by the slowness of time and, and by silence. It's a very heavy silence. Now, Aweli is completely different. Aweli is a game where you can pretty easily talk. You can exchange. In fact, you can talk and play very fast, very dexterously. You can, you can, you know, both talk and play and exchange not just seeds, but words in Aweli. To take a look at strategy, Aweli is a centrifugal game. You, you move against the opponent, you win on the opponent's field. And Go is also centrifugal. Go is a game which is won in the corners, on the outskirts of the board, very, very rarely at the center. Chess now is very different. Chess is a game which is played and won at the center of the board and a game where initiative is very important, much more important than in Go or Aweli. Now, as to the structure of, of the practice of these games, Go and chess are relatively alike. They have federations, both at national and international levels. They've got youth clubs. They have competitions with very highly paid uh, prizes in competitions and very ancient structures for competing in Japan in particular. And the media coverage of the competing is extremely intense. Awali is not at that le this level yet. It remains much more informal, though things are beginning to change, I believe. These three games are quite similar in their potential for developing the cognitive abilities of players and particularly of children. Now, this is specifically true of Aweli, which develops, as we will see, the mathematical facilities in that it really seems to be the cousin of, of the old abacus. That is a universal dimension in Aweli, which really ought to be developed. And what makes Awali, in my personal opinion, the most attractive and the most magical is probably that it is the game with the easiest rules, that it is a game that's really easy to understand and that it is a game that can be built in just an instant. All you have to do is dig a few holes in the sand or in the ground or draw a few circles with chalk in the schoolyard and then you can start to play. And that is a very important aspect of Awali and really a dimension that should guarantee Awali a growing success in times to come. We are very, very far from done marveling over Awali. Thank you, Pascal Risset, for this comparison between the three games. These are now international games, and we we expect, uh, well, I'm sure that uh, the promoters of the game, which are, who are be, going to be with us, uh, are leading us to explain, to expect that Awali is going to develop and soon reach the level of its colleagues, the games of Go and chess. And we are now going to take some uh, exchanges uh, between the panelists and the discussants. Professor, uh, Yukuri Kasumi from Burkina Faso is a philosopher and an Egyptologist. And he met a, a tradition of intellectual gaming in, in ancient Africa. Now, we don't really know the history of Africa and the way in which it reached the current shape it has today. 
people might well ask if this is a, an, an intellectual African game, are there other strategic and intellectual games in Africa? So I'm going to ask Yuku Kasume, who is with us, to please take the floor and give us some information. In just a few minutes, we have only very little time, unfortunately. Good afternoon to you all, to uh, uh, you, Mr. Belinda, and thank you for uh, having in invited me to uh, this uh, 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 symposium. I heard a lot of interesting things. Uh, and uh, with the uh, two, three minutes uh, that I have, I will uh, uh, speak about one game, uh, which in its rule is similar to uh, Awale. Now we need uh, to reflect the history of uh, Awale, uh, to connect up uh, with uh, Awale. It's uh, a game from the first dynasty of old uh, time in Egypt. Uh, it is called Senate. Let me explain this way. Uh, Senate comes from an Egyptian verb, seni, which means uh, uh, passing, exceeding, or winning over. So uh, uh, passing, exceeding, winning over. And uh, to uh, prepare uh, this uh, intervention, I looked at uh, uh, a writing uh, dating back from uh, uh, 1906, where someone listed the different names of this game and we reach the Nile Valley with the Nubians and we have the same game called Amangala. And Zen Belinga mentioned it and he said it comes from Arabic, moving, uh, carrying from one place to another. And uh, I compare with the uh, word Sene, uh, and uh, that is interesting. And in the uh, uh, authentics, uh, in the extreme south of the continent, uh, it exists. And they call it the game of the uh, tiger and the lamb. And then I link up uh, to uh, Egypt. And uh, in uh, in a papyrus uh, from uh, uh, Durin, uh, you know the heretic uh, uh, papyrus, but you have a satirical uh, papyrus uh, where you have a, a lion playing a senate game uh, with the an antelope. You know that uh, a lion and an antelope can never uh, be together unless. Uh, over a game. So it has a uh, sociological uh, value. So even in ancient uh, Egypt with the hierarchy over this game, there is equality. We don't know uh, uh, well who is uh, winning in this satirical papyrus. Maybe it's the antelope. This is the one aspect. Another uh, one, uh, another aspect is something that was said in uh, Sheila Walker before concluding. Uh, someone from Antigua said this is the only thing that uh, people carried uh, with them to uh, when they die. So uh, Senate, uh, as I said, uh, passing, exceeding, overcoming, it means uh, that you're also uh, passing on. Uh, to the other world. Uh, uh, you've seen uh, uh, Ramses uh, the second playing. And um, you can, when you look at this picture, you have the feeling that the partner, she has no partner, uh, but the partner is there. And if she wins, it means that uh, she goes to the other world. Uh, so these are some elements that I just wanted to speak. So maybe we should add that to the history of Awale. It could be interesting. And uh, so 30 seconds. Uh, uh, and uh, we have Castigari, uh, Renando, uh, 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 that is uh, um, correcting uh, uh, habits uh, uh, in while playing or correcting ways over games. So that is interesting. Uh, luckily, you're uh, uh, 
uh, uh, speaking to all the uh, participants that we would like to uh, greet, but you're also speaking to the director of Présence Africaine. Uh, she knows that there's a lot of work to do in order to be able uh, to collect uh, all the information missing on uh, Awale. We know that there are many uh, uh, things, uh, information, uh, games, uh, games which are used to convey social rules. So I'll ask somebody else uh, to uh, join us in the uh, discussions uh, on Awale and uh, the, the whole uh, uh, group of Mangalad game. Uh, well, there are discussions about the origin. Some people say that maybe the Sumerians uh, used it uh, for accounting. Uh, some people say that uh, maybe it was also uh, in the field of uh, uh, guessing. Uh, 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 so uh, we have uh, uh, maybe divination, but we have Serge uh, Yoruba uh, from Benin, and uh, we have asked him to uh, provide us with some information from the region he is really familiar with. Can you hear me? Good. Uh, Afternoon to all of you. I am uh, pleased to be uh, on this panel. As you can see from my name, I come from Benin in West Africa, and uh, my mother is uh, Yoruba. So I come from a uh, Yoruba tradition. Uh, now, in uh, Fon, it is Aji, Aji spirit, and also Ayo. So depending on uh, the uh, populations uh, uh, in African societies, the name can change. Now for fortune telling, we use it uh, as a social element. Uh, and we use it also to educate. And as you've seen in the uh, uh, video clip, all children uh, from uh, uh, a younger age uh, play this game because you can use a board or you can just uh, dig pits uh, during uh, uh, the uh, uh, your recess time. Uh, so it develops uh, the uh, cognitive capacities from the spiritual uh, point of view. It is also important because there are some codes. You can use it as a codes uh, in the fa, which is the art of fortune telling. Uh, when the fortune tellers, the babalao or vodu, use uh, uh, the uh, uh, shells uh, to announce the different signs displayed by the fa called the du. You can also do the same thing through the game in order to disseminate the information. So through a wale, a G or whatever the name, Africa, will also bring uh, its uh, science, uh, uh, mathematics, uh, because our uh, uh, civilization was developed through uh, pedagogy, uh, learn by playing. Thank you very much, uh, Serge. Uh, I'm sorry, I hope I did not actually uh, disrupt the other activities of the prince. So the second panel is different. It's a panel of players devoted to promoters of the game. Uh, there are several dimensions. We know that uh, there is a dimension which is really uh, uh, rooted in the in the in the culture, uh, uh, the values of African uh, values, African societies, and the way it uh, it is spread all over the continent and outside the continent. And we also have the relationship, the kinship between different uh, uh, 
uh, African populations. So this is something which is really rich from the cultural point of view, from the heritage point of view. And we know that, uh, well, Awale raises questions even be beyond Africa. It's Awale is about sharing uh, their rules, solidarity, uh, um, equality. Thank you to our four uh, speakers uh, who will intervene. Uh, they have specificities. They're uh, uh, people who are players. Uh, they organize games. Uh, they have uh, a long uh, uh, um, background of uh, organizing uh, uh, competitions of people who are uh, endeavoring to uh, make this uh, game popular beyond uh, Africa. Uh, we know that uh, it is not an obvious work. They don't get a lot of support, but they've been doing this for years with a lot of talent. So I would like to uh, congratulate them, encourage them, and, uh, and, and thank them uh, for the work that they're doing. So they're different uh, uh, people. Uh, I'd like to mention here, the, 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 you, you see you have to uh, stick by the uh, 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 seniority. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Obakalin. So you will all introduce yourselves. Uh, Mr. Obakalin first, then Mr. Uh, Set Bonti. Then we have Mr. Guy uh, Sepayi. And uh, we will uh, end uh, uh, with the youngest in the group, uh, Ngufu and Gaminaz. Well, just take uh, two or three minutes to tell us what you're doing to promote this game. And then we will ask you first the questions. Uh, first, uh, Mr. Uba Collins. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, there's a lot to say. Um, first of all, my name is Oba Collins. Um, I'm born and raised in New York City. I'm from 144th Street and Lenox Avenue. And I'm as proud to say that as someone who would say they're from Antigua or from Senegal, anywhere like that. My, my point in saying that is because I grew up um, until I was 22, not having any concept of being an African. And when I began to have that concept, I became a born again African and I began to learn through my studies about an African board game um, based on mathematics and thinking, which eventually I found as a souvenir in St. Thomas Virgin Islands. And when I came home with that game, the rules were very, very limited and I began to um, try to find more information about the game, and this was before the internet, and eventually it, I took it on as a personal project to um, find out more information about the game and to share it with those around me, because uh, I found it very interesting. Um, very fortunately, I eventually, um, within the coming of the internet, got to meet uh, Seth Bonte and hear about many other folks around the world who were, who were doing the same thing I was doing as far as um, you know, digging their interest in the game and, and sharing it with others. And um, I'm not an anthropologist. And one thing I can say is like almost everything that I have learned about the game, I have heard the opposite at another time. So um, I have a lot of opinions about the game. Um, I like to also say that, um, you know, we must remember that if I say worry, you say a wally. If you say Awali, somebody says Awari. Somebody says Awari, somebody says Mancala. So this is a great thing that we're coming together to um, explore all of these ways of thinking and, and ideas about the game and, and, and come to a conclusion one day of a final body that will have a standard that can be followed around the world. Was that okay? And that's it? Merci. Oui, c'est une c'est une bonne entrée en, en matière. Uh, Thank merci. you. That was an excellent introduction. Now we're going to give the floor to one of the veterans in advocacy for this game in in Europe, and that's Mr. Seth Bonti. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, well, good morning also to those who are in different parts of the world. Uh, my name is Seth Bonti Asamwa, uh, president of the Hawaii Society and interim president of the World Owari Federation. Um, 
Yawar Society has been in existence for 26 years now. Uh, it started in 1995. And in that time, uh, we've conducted workshops in schools and museums, predominantly in London and the surrounding counties. We've also conducted workshops in libraries as well. Um, we've also conducted um, national championships for schools and open championships in the UK. Um, we've conducted um, the Maya Sports Olympia Championships for the first four years uh, from 1997 to 2000 that were held in London. Um, since 1998, we've consistently conducted um, international Awale Championships in France at the International Festival du Jeu. Uh, that has attracted players from all over the world. Um, we've also supported and sponsored championships in Ghana and the Gambia, uh, supported championships in uh, Spain, in Catalonia and in um, Bilbao, and also actually attended championships in Switzerland, Czech Republic and Poland as well, where we actually um, refereed as well. Um, we've also actually helped some um, program um, app developers actually review their apps for playing Awale over the years. And we've also helped to facilitate uh, players attending international championships at the Third World Nomad Games, at the um, championship in Almaty and Astana in Kazakhstan and also at the Ethno Festival Intellectual Games in Saudi Arabia that took, place, that took part in 2019. So, you know, over the years, we've actually, you know, conducted quite a, a resume of actually activities. And, um, you know, uh, hopefully that has actually helped keep uh, Awali playing in the consciousness of um, the world populace. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, alors, euh, donc deux, euh, un des plus anciens donc dans, la, dans cette bataille pour faire la première. One of the uh, great advocates of uh, Awali is there, and now we're going to a great activity. Of course, they they know one another, but this uh, speaker is not African, but has been playing Awali for a number of years. It's Mr. Guy Sepahi. You have the floor, sir. Good day, and thank you for giving us this wonderful uh, opportunity to present my view of things. Of course, I'm a, a bit of the odd man out in this uh, very distinguished uh, group you have here. But I'd just like to tell you a, a short story in two minutes now. Once upon a time, there was a young man who was 21 years old. Uh, And uh, he was uh, wandering around uh, uh, near Cannes in France. I'm sure you've seen it with the Cannes Film Festival and the red carpet. And uh, he just discovered that the stars that he was interested in were games. And uh, it was uh, the International Games Festival, that now just in Europe. And I went uh, to that uh, and I discovered uh, games. Well, we've already heard about chess and Go, which I knew about. But I discovered a stand where there was uh, two people uh, and they were sitting there one in. I took it home and I had uh, uh, games which uh, were for three year olds and five years old. Now, the I, had two, I had two children, three years old and five years old. The uh, five year old wasn't too interested, but the three year old left it. But uh, uh, by the age he was uh, three and a half or four, he was playing full uh, full matches, uh, full games. And so that was a real discovery. And I have been able to introduce more than 9,000 people to this game in the space of 20 years. And I've met many distinguished people such as we see today. And I enjoy the spreading the values of this game, which we have brought from the African continent to, to Europe. Thank you very much, dear Guy. Now we're going to go to the youngest of our group of promoters here. He's smiling. Now, Ngufo Ganyemaz, now you're young, uh, you've done a lot of things. 
and uh, I would have thought that you'd move away from Awani. Could you uh, introduce yourself and tell us how you became so interested in Awani? And perhaps we can do it the other way around. Perhaps you could give us a, a review of the situation and say how you uh, do advocacy for Awani, and then I'll go back to the uh, to the other panelists. Uh, no, thank you, Marciane. Yes, I'm the youngest of the of the group uh, here for the promoters. I am from Ethiopian descent, and I would like to uh, uh, greet you all. I'm Ngufo, Ngufo Ganymaz, and I'm, uh, as you pointed out, uh, an Awali player. Now, for some 15 years, I've been involved in personal development, and I look at around the world and see what makes uh, some countries or some uh, civilizations so strong, and I thought about that. And I should also say that I just uh, uh, ran into a, a Wale in a, a random way. I, I, it was a, a bit like the others. Be, I discovered it, but I discovered that there was more than just a game. It was a language for children. You, you could learn about uh, beating, you, competing. And I was interested in the game. And so I decided that I would set up an organization which would promote it on a larger scale, which I did with the Awale Club in Paris. Thank you very much. Now we're going to go anti-clockwise. In other words, the, the last one will start with you. Uh, we, we won't have much time for a lot of questions, but could you just tell us in a few words uh, what the situation is like with promoting Awali at the moment, and what's the main uh, uh, progress you've made, and what's the main obstacle. And then we'll be able to come and have a look and see what solutions. Well, to review the situation, well, uh, yes. What are, the, what are the limits? Now, I could review the last five years because I set up a club in 2016 and it focused in France because that's where I live. I'd say that the situation is still fairly modest because everyone knows that well, they've got a game at home, but uh, people don't realize that it's a, a strategy game such as Go or Chess. Uh, and uh, uh, people don't realize the hidden virtues of Awani. Of course, there are the players now emerging and who are involved in festivals and they work in tournaments and championships and introduce their children to the game. But I think there's still a lot of, of work to, to do before we reach the level of go or chess. And of course, to get the financial support, of course. So the progress over recent years. Uh, what's the main point of progress and what's the main obstacle? Well, the main point of progress is to see that the leading organizations and institutions involved in games know what they, they see it involved with uh, uh, at the same level as Go and Chess. When people talk about intellectual games, they mention Awane. So that's, uh, that's really a good achievement. And there are more and more applications and software programs which will get people to play a digital form of the game. And uh, you need to have that, of course. Now, the difficulties, and I'd say the main difficulty is the label because uh, it's a persistent label. People just think it was a, a game they learnt at school and they don't see it as a complex or strategic game. They just think it was a game to learn how to add up and do basic arithmetic. And so uh, that's a label which is hard to get rid of. And while he doesn't have the prestige or, or chess or as chess or go do. And of course, uh, Awale supporters who we know can't uh, uh, believe that, uh, that it will go on like this. They can't think it's just going to be kept as a souvenir or a decorative feature in a, in a household. They're sure that it will become a real game. Well, thank you very much. So you're lucky enough or perhaps unlucky enough to be young. So you've got plenty of time to devote your defense of Awale. 
How about uh, Guy? Because Guy's uh, trained 9,000 people, he said, to play um, uh, uh, one A. So things have moved ahead. So, Guy, where would you see things? Do you think things have moved ahead or not enough? And what do you think the main obstacles are? J'ai l'impression que je n'ai pas Guy, uh, c'est pas I pour le moment. I think we don't have Guy online at the moment. So we'll go to Seth Bontier Asamora. Thank you. Could you tell yeah. me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, so the main obstacles, I believe, are um, there's a lack of organization, you know, worldwide organization. Um, to actually steer the activities of Awale. Um, also, I think there is an underestimation by even enthusiasts and, and adherents and players of Awale as to its actual value to society. So, you know, I think that um, needs to be overcome. Um, and then also, you know, we live in a very competitive world especially for the youngsters, you know, there's a lot competing for their time. So those who are promoting Awale, um, I think he needs to realize this, upskill themselves or bring in, you know, people with the necessary skills to actually effectively market activities that are taking place and also, you know, market um, future activities as well. Um, Would think, you talk you about know, the kind of professionalization of uh, the promotion of Awale or kind of Awale industry or something like that? That's right. The professionalization of Awale promotion. You know, it's yeah. a very competitive world. You know, electronic games have actually become predominant. Um, so if you're going to be, if you're going to make any headway, then you've really got to actually compete on a, you know, equal level to actually try and actually attract people to your activity. So I think this is what we've got to realize, you know, in the Awale fraternity, that um, we've got to actually, you know, adopt these, you know, skills and processes to actually attract people to the game. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you so much. Uh, Baba Oba, it's up to you. Uh, I would say... Uh, uh, Robert, Robert Collins. You have many rules, you know, in different you know, parts of the continent, in Africa, in this place. Is it something that is a, a weakness for the promotion of our league? Um, I'm looking at it this way. Um, there is no problem with the game or promotion or even obstacles, depending on your perspective and how you look at it. And the reason I say that is because we're talking about a game that is considered the oldest game in the world, played a hundred and million different ways from a continent, you know, that has um, so-called 54 countries. Um, but when you, you know, when this game is played one way or another in each one of those countries and the islands next to these countries um, on, on the continent. And it has uh, been carried around the world, you know, by Africans in one form or other, another from the day one when so-called slavery was um, started to even today, you know, just from simple immigration. So my thing is, you know, like you say, there's millions of ways to play and there's many different variations. and you know, what we even doing today is proof that it will always survive. It's not a resurgence of a game that was lost one day and now we found it again. You know, um, all, many of us are an example of how we have found it in our own little way and then found each other to share this information. And that's going to continue. Uh, and like Seth said, yeah, there will be um, a body one day that could be recognized as not telling people how to play and how not to play, but we'll, but we'll tell them how to play in a particular way so that when we have a standard for um, how, having an international tournament, we're playing in one particular way, you know, for, you know, that tournament and competition, you know, but not telling people that you don't play this way, you don't play that way, but just having a standard that we all can follow. Um, you know, one thing I learned from the young folks and um, is they say, stop, look, think, and move, which is the basis of all strategy board games. And one thing I like to stress with the comparison of Wari, Mancala, Awali, Awari with chess is that chess is a war game. 
Wally, Awari, Awali, and Awari are counting thinking games. It has nothing to do with war. So the comparison between the two and the similarities is because of the sophistication of thinking. To stop, look, think, and move. Decision making. Okay, so this is going to continue um, from the youngest person you have on the on the symposium speaking today to an elder like me, who back in 1977 when I brought my first game, mm. and 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 had to begin to find information. It's going to continue, and I think what we're doing today with this symposium is great. And I thank the folks who get it together to, um, you know, for doing it so that it can continue in the future. Oh, thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. Alors, ce qu'on voit, c'est qu'on entend, et c'est très Thank you very much. No. It's very interesting because we can see there are different approaches with the different players and different intentions. And there may be one approach which is more culturally based and one which is more competitive. So if we have two approaches, is that a good way of promoting the game or is it a negative impact? Now, if you each had one statement to make, what would be the ideal thing to do to get the game to the level that you hope to see it at? Someone might think it should be an Olympic sport or something else. What uh, can we do to reach the level that you hope to see for the game? And now we'll do it the other way around. Uh, I'll start with Mr. Oba and then Mr. Uh, Seth Bonti and we'll end up with the youngest ones. Uh, I'm sorry, I've come back. Uh, well, then you'll, you'll conclude uh, you, for the last question. Just one minute for each speaker because we have another panel afterwards and we're already running late. And we don't want to uh, uh, frustrate uh, the next speakers who will have uh, less time to speak. So we'll go in that order. To reach the level that you expect it to reach. I meant you're asking me to speak next? Yeah. What, for one oh. minute, it will be your conclusion. Um, that uh, we continue what we're doing, and uh, I support SEF and the work that he's already done. We're talking to folks around the world in different places in terms of finding an organization or federation to, um, like I say, set a standard for particular ways of play so that they can be used in different places in the same way. But, we're, but without telling people that you can't play this way, you can't play this way, but you know, we have a standard that we use so that it can be um, recognized as a, a, as a way of the federation or organization, you know, and we, and, we, and we play by the same standard when it comes to those kind of tournaments. Okay. Um, la, la parole, donc, à... Uh... Uh, Mr. Seth Bontia Samoa, what would you say? What... I'm going to give the floor to Seth Bontia Samoa. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, what I would say is to organize, organize, organize. There are hundreds, if not thousands, or hundreds of thousands of Awali playing groups. I am personally in touch with about a hundred of them who actually play Awale every day, you know, from midday, you know, to sunset. And what I've realized is that, um, you know, these groups are not organized. We are now beginning to see, you know, fledgling attempts to actually organize. There is one national association um, of Wari players in Antigua. There is an association of Wari players in Togo and Benin. Um, who have actually, you know, basically organized several playing groups together in parts of the country. But, you know, all these thousands, hundreds of thousands of playing groups, which have between 20 to, say, 30 players in each group, we have to support them and actually organize, 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 because the okay. players are already there. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, alors, Guy, ça va être à vous, parce que vous avez... Vous And avez... now, Guy, it's your turn. 
you you would got disconnected there but here's the question to conclude because we have to conclude it's a shame we shouldn't because we've only just started but if we have to conclude this panel please tell us about the thing that you believe is needed to bring awali up to the level where you would like it to be well, I can't really answer this question right now because, you know, Awali to me is, is not a profession. It's, it's, uh, it's fun to me. My job is about, uh, cons uh, you know, consulting and management. But, but I think there are some ideas that are needed for this game to, to develop and, and be promoted. To me, Awali is not chess in Africa. Chess is about murder. Awali is about exchanging. The, the very meaning of the game of Awali is that you must give in order to receive. And that is a value. In fact, I have a friend who told me that Awali is the, the strategic game of sustainable development. So can there be anything more up to date than this concept? So we need to grab this concept and make it the battle horse of, of the game. I, I, and I brought Awali to a child who was no more than two or three years of age. So out of the very small amount of time that I have in which to say something, I'll say, let's stick to this idea. Let's promote this game on the basis of this idea, this idea that you've got to feed your, the other and not kill the other. You need to feed the land. You need to feed people. You need to give water to the land. And it, there's nothing to gain from destroying. That is my idea. Thank you very much. To make a wali live you must enable it to live off its own values particularly sustainable development thank you very much now i'm going to have to cut your speaking time because as you know we're late and the others are waiting i can see people out there staring at me you know with fire in their eyes so you're going to tell me you know, you, you're young, you can speak fast. Is there a measure that is needed to bring the game up to where you want it to be? What, what would you say it is? We need to bring out professionals who can demonstrate to the public what Iwali, uh, what Iwali can do for collective and personal development. Okay. Well, there's a lot to be done on, on in that framework. I'm not going to give you time to develop your thoughts here, but you know that uh, Présence Africaine has announced the publication of uh, the, 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 the discussions of this symposium. So there'll be publications to come. You'll be able to develop your thoughts on that. Well, I thank you very much. We could have gone on forever, but we just did not have the time. Thank you very much for having dropped your daily business to connect here. It was truly a pleasure and very gainful to listen to you today. I do hope that we're only briefly parting and that we will meet again over time, more professionally, in view of development, uh, uh, sustainable development and in uh, benefiting personal as well as collective interests. We're going to now move on to the next panel, which again is pre-recorded. So this is not actually a round table. These are recorded videos, but the theme of this panel is Awali and math, experiences of pedagogical use. We're going to meet some people who see in Awali mostly We've, we've already met people who work with Awali as a game, as a competition, but now we're, we're going to go to other professionals, people who use Awali with different groups, particularly schools and institutional uh, bodies. And to begin uh, the panel, we are going to take the recorded video of Miss Ruth Ryu. Unless, unless it's not Madame Ryu, I want to point out quickly to the previous speakers that they are very much uh, invited to stay with us. They were just told. Uh, uh, goodbye, basically. But please stay with us until the end of the symposium. Stay with us until tomorrow afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Madam uh, Director. I'm now going to give the floor to a teacher who teaches in uh, the, in the uh, French overseas uh, departments of the Caribbean.
She's a teacher in uh, physics as well as chemistry and mathematics, and she uses Awali to explain mathematical concepts. I introduce Madame Ruth, Ma Ruth Rio, who's going to tell us how she uses math in her teaching, in her day-to-day uh, -day teaching of mathematics. My name is uh, Ruth Rieu, and I teach mathematics, physics, and chemistry in a vocational high school. Before working on the principles and theorems of a mathematics concept, I suggest my students to discover its history. They discover then that the African continent has an important place in the history of mathematics that makes it possible to change their perception. In this video, I'll introduce the Awali game that I use during my classes on probability. I chose this game for three reasons. First, it's a game that leads the player to devise a strategy. Therefore, the students will develop their analytical mind and improve their ability to look for solutions. These are skills that they will be able to develop in other subject matters. And finally, the Awali game possesses the essential criteria to start work on probability because it's a game with a limited number of players, only two. The game time is short and the rules are simple. And of course, uh, since it's a, a game, the students learn and understand better the vocabulary and calculations related to probabilities. During the first session, the students discover through documents or, uh, or internet sites, the playboard and the rules of the game. Very soon, they're invited to play. And this is when some decide uh, to use uh, strategies to make sure they'll win, no matter who uh, the opponent is. At this point, I asked them to write down on a piece of paper the pit from which the opponent will start and to indicate by circling or underlying if uh, their forecast was right or wrong. For students who find it more difficult to use this strategy, I suggest an online playboard. Of course, the students will play against the computer, but they will get an important support. Indeed, when they move the mouse to one uh, uh, of the pit, they'll get the number of seats in that a pit, and there is a white dot which shows them where the last seed will land. Once I've made sure that they have understood the rules well, I suggest that they study a game. In this game uh, that uh, started already 10 minutes ago, the objective is to know from which pit Mark should start in order to capture uh, seats. The students have to choose between pits A, C, and F. They quickly find the pit that uh, should be started with, but they also discover that the probability that Mark will start with that pit is exactly the same as that of two other pits. So this is what we call equiprobability. Uh, you can also continue this activity asking students to develop a strategy to win the game, whether you're Mark or Laura. And finally, with Awale, one can also study conditional probability. However, to simplify calculations, it is preferable to use a, 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 a version called the little worry. As you can see, the board is smaller since it is made up of uh, six bits, uh, three for each player, and the number of seats is also smaller. Uh, this uh, will make calculations easier uh, for the students since the game time is short, because uh, when one player captures eight seats, the game is over. I hope this uh, video uh, made you feel like uh, uh, starting to, to play Awali and uh, discovering all its treasures. I would like to thank Présence Africaine and Mr. Martial Zébelinga for having invited me to take part in this symposium on Awali. Thank you to you all.
for your attention and goodbye. Thank you very much to uh, Ruth Rieu. We've seen how it goes beyond game. Uh, it, uh, it is used in uh, education, in teaching, and uh, we will also uh, see with uh, Michel Ambwe. Uh, he is a researcher in education sciences. Uh, he is a former uh, math, math teacher, and he has set up an association to disseminate mathematics for uh, younger uh, pupils. And he will uh, also speak about his experience. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Michel Tamboué. Uh, initially, I'm a maths teacher and I'm a promoter of an association uh, involved in uh, uh, dissemination of uh, maths education in Kinshasa. And I also work at the Ministry of National Education in a government program, it's a project which is in charge of reforming uh, curricula in the area of uh, mathematics and science education. We have some experience in the Awale game. Uh, Awale is uh, an African game uh, that uh, uh, we are used to using in a teach as a teaching material in maths education. Uh, now I'm speaking in this uh, uh, symposium on the theme of Awale and mathematics experiences of educational users. Indeed, it's a game that can be used as an educational uh, material, a teaching material, uh, to teach a lot of mathematical concepts. Depending on the level, uh, the student can choose uh, uh, the, the lesson, and uh, depending on the level of the class where the teacher is, uh, he can do a lot or she can do a lot. Um, there are many things that can be done with this game. Uh, based on our experience, we've used the game several times in the manipulation of numbers with younger children, namely the first uh, two years of primary level at elementary level. This is when children learn how to count to one, two, three, four, five, six. So we used a practical tip. It's a small adaptation that we made. At the beginning, we have numbered the, 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 the pits. Uh, once we have numbered the pits, children can uh, locate the pits easily uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, carry out uh, um, arithmetic operations. In this game, there are two players. Each player has uh, uh, um, 12 uh, uh, pits. Uh, which um, they will have to distribute uh, seeds. Uh, depending on the level of players and the level of the game, there is a set number of seeds. But here our experience is with uh, very young children, as I said, to do easy operations like additions, five plus three. And the purpose uh, here is to enable children to identify or locate the pit from which they will start uh, this operation. And since the uh, uh, pits are numbered, we want to do a simple operation, five plus three. We want to solve that operation. The, the children just need to locate the fifth pit. So uh, we uh, place ourselves at the level of the fifth pit. So we take three seats that we put in the fifth pit. So this is where we place ourselves. We wonder what is the result of five plus three. So we take three seats, seats that we put in the fifth pit, and uh, we start distributing the three seats successively in the following pits. Normally, the third seed will land in the eighth pit. So it means that if you add five and three, you get eight. So these are the simple uh, operations that uh, we uh, do with children. It doesn't take much time. Children learn easily because uh, these are simple and practical things. And because it's a game, uh, children really enjoy it. Uh, they learn as they play, and they remember it once and for all. It's a logic 
that children absorb when they do operations. And of course, as I said initially, it depends on the teacher. Someone who wants to teach natural numbers to children can also use this game. But uh, as I said, we limit ourselves to the uh, elementary uh, level first with these uh, small operations like uh, additions. We also uh, work on how to find the remainder of uh, a division. It's a division by 12. Even the numbers that we use are below 12 because there are only 12 bits in the game. And uh, in that case, it is simple. If children find themselves with a number of seats above 12, and let me give you an example. Let's suppose that children find themselves with 15 seats. Uh, for us, the operation they have to do is to determine the remainder of the division of 12 by, of 15 by 12. Children will start distributing the 15 seats in their hand among the 12 pits. The seeds remaining in their hand will be the remainder of the division of 12, of 15 by 12. We can use any number. The principle will be the same. The remainder of the division of any number by 12 will be the number of seeds remaining in their hand after they have distributed all the seeds they had among the 12 pits. Once uh, children are able to identify the remainder of a division by 12, we think that uh, uh, they can also find the remainder of a division by 15, 14, 20, and so on. So this uh, is our experience with the Awali game. Thank you. So this uh, is an interesting uh, experience from the DRC, and we can see that, uh, well, uh, the players can be uh, high school uh, students, uh, primary level students, uh, um, uh, uh, tertiary level students, and uh, 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 adults. Uh, we have uh, uh, also uh, Mr. Gervais Louambe, scientific columnist, founder of uh, an international association. Uh, he has prepared an interesting uh, subject that uh, we are going uh, to uh, uh, develop uh, in two parts. Uh, there is a, a short film, and also he'll explain how a small institution can promote Awali. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, Good afternoon. It is a great pleasure to stand here before you to present Awali, which is an object to be with, to begin with. But it is also a game and an interesting starting point to discuss and get to know Africa, this great continent which owns a great diversity of customs and practices and a huge multiplicity of languages and certain objects have a great many names. In fact, Awali in Côte d'Ivoire and in Western Africa is called something else. In Congo, for example, or in Angola, where it is known as Ongolo, Ongolo, or in Cameroon, Songo, or elsewhere, other names such as Wari Wari. So this is a mythical object in my own eyes, a traditional object and also a work of art. Is It's also an opportunity at first to play, playing, which is a defining characteristic of children. In fact, according to the rights of the child, the child uh, has the right to play time. And beyond this object, which is a shared African toy, there are a great many playing children, but it goes beyond that. It's not only children, men also play. Depending on their social class, which already takes us to a sociological aspect of the game of Awali. It is interesting to get to know Africa through the game of Awali because, as we will see, many different disciplines come into play. There is a sociological aspect, which I just briefly touched upon. You don't 
actually play a wali quite the same depending on whether you are a man or a woman, a child or an adult. So that's the sociological aspect. The game will also be encountered in other places, other continents, such as the Asian continent, such as the American continent, where captives who were taken to America brought with them the practice of Awali. We will stick to this name. We have to agree on one generic appellation, don't we? So let it be Awali, not Ongolo or Wari Wari, and, and I think that will work out fine. So. There is a sociological aspect, as we have briefly discussed, but there are also artistic aspects to this object. It is a work of art. You should see the different variations on the subject, the different materials used to make it. In Africa, it's usually now made of wood, but in the early days, it was actually made from the soil. It was simply made by digging holes in the ground or in the sand, and these rows of holes would make it possible to play. For the game, you would use beads or seeds, and there you are. The, the game could be played by anyone, anywhere. So beyond the sociological aspects and the technical craft aspects, of making the game from, from one or other type of material. Here in schools, there are many other ways. You can make it with, with Play-Doh, you can make it with, uh, with uh, salt and flour, and it gives you different ways of counting, numbering, combinatory analysis, there are combinations that you can come to quite spontaneously without actually thinking, or at least not thinking in the way that is recognized as thinking. So these are all very interesting aspects. And then there's the very interesting, attractive aspect of calming things down, of concentrating for the type of activity that is known as playing. As, as to me, I have worked quite hard for this game to be better known because it's a very interesting tool to understand history because there are different historiographic aspects that, depending on the regions where Awali is played. It also has geographical interest because you need to look at the different places where you play Awali. There's math, there's geometry, because you have to use different geometrical instruments to produce a game of Awali. So with all these different aspects, we came to consider that just from the point of view of how many different things could be learned from Awali, it was a very interesting object to use to talk about Africa and, and to spread the game as itself here on this continent, here in France. And it was a very useful tool. In fact, it was immediately very popular in the associations, in the events where it was very quickly visible that people got into it. They would come to the stand, they would play the game. We saw 50 people gathering at first. By the end of the day, there'd be 100 people playing, gaming. And what was also fascinating is that you, you could see very different people playing very different levels of education would and would be uh, playing against each other. And it was very interesting to see that it wasn't necessarily the most educated people, the most brilliant people, the people who were most immediately seen to be brilliant, who would win. There'd be an exchange, there'd be a sort of uh, popularization of certain subjects, such as arithmetics and ge geometry, etc. This was very interesting as such in what it says about learning and, and discovering new knowledge in an entirely playful environment. So we, uh, we uh, experimented with it at ISCO in the days when I was the chair, and the thing was found sufficiently interesting to be picked up again. It was used in the science um, FET, uh, and there were many participants in the game, and then it was picked up again and reproduced in uh, schools, in different uh, educational institutions, and the championship was launched at the Academy of Orléans Tours, and the schools and colleges were very interested, and we were fortunate to have the sous-préfet and the delegate of the préfet 
Efe and the mayor, and of course the authorities of the, the national educational institution came and encouraged the children who were running and the people, the children who were who won and who were given prizes. So it's getting increasingly practiced. There are many schools participating. University has participated and developed an application so that it can be played at the distance and it can be uh, accessed by internet. So many people got involved. In fact, Polytech, an engineer school, decided to produce uh, Awalis with a 3D printer. So basically, the game brought out synergies between university, an engineer school, colleges uh, uh, in the French sense, meaning uh, junior high schools and primary schools and parents who were very happy to see that upon returning from school, the children did not necessarily throw themselves over their telephones, or at least not as much as they had previously done, but sometimes they would just sit playing with the awali, which in itself has a positive impact on sustainable development. So don't let me get into the mystical or traditional aspects of the game, not today. I do think that the game is sufficiently open that it could serve for many other different purposes. I'm sure that the game is going to spread. We have recently heard that the Lions Club International decided to carry on with uh, Awali in our own uh, academy, um, school academy of Orléans Tour. So, um, well, my wishes certainly uh, go go with that uh, endeavor. At AESCO, with the director of AESCO, uh, we would like the game to carry on spreading and, and being played. It's increasingly successful. In, in an increasing number of cities. I'm sure we're going to reach other cities, including Tours and Clamcy, etc. So I hope I gave you an idea of what could be done and that we will meet again to discuss what can be done yet in the future on the national level, on an international level. Why not organize our Wally Championships? Thank you. Thank you very much, Gervais Loembe. This uh, gave us an idea of of how far Awale may go in its in its uh, original dimension as a as something that you can make as something that you can play and as something that can represent African cultures. Awale surely is a tool that can be used in many different ways, including in schools and not only in math. And that's a very fine thing indeed. Perhaps we could go further and discover, since Mr. Lewembe. Uh, is uh, one of the big supporters of the project. Uh, isn't that so, Madame Diop? He's been supporting the project from, for a long time, and he sent a video that gives uh, a, a, a perhaps more visual idea of what can be done, uh, what has been done by his association. And this can probably give other people some ideas. So let's check out this video before we go on to the next discussant. <laughs> The game of Awali is something that people really get into here at the FET of the Associations of the Agglomeration of Orléans. The game of Awali at the game of at the Day of Science of the University of Orléans. For a month, it was uh, exhibited by the uh, societies of. Uh, Abidjan. In Côte d'Ivoire, there's a rediscovery of this scientific and educational activity in partnership with scientists in mathematics from the universities of Orléans and Abidjan. And here is the third edition of the Festival of Awali with 1,500 players from schools and college and high schools in Orléans. The finalists were rewarded in uh, at an, a celebration attended by the prefect, the sous-prefet, the mayor, and a number of other eminent personalities of Orléans, as well as their proud parents. That was a memorable day. For the year 2021, the Awali Championship will be attended by more two, than 2,000 children from schools and uh, junior high schools in Orléans and its neighboring municipalities. Many local townships around Orléans are involved in AESCO, as well as the Institution of Technological Education of Orléans and the Ministry of uh, Education is organizing the fourth edition of Awali Championship and mathematical game, strategic game and combinatory analysis. Here is the competition 
the training session for the championship in the metropole, the metropole of Orléans. The president of the French Republic attended during Africa 2020. Many students from the, uh, in the uh, University uh, Institute of Technology have chosen to play with Awali and create an application so you can play Awali online on the internet. Another way of attending the fourth edition of the championship of Awali. Interpreters do not, can't really interpret with music on, so we have done our best. Thank you very much. Very fine pictures, wonderful music. No, I'm in a difficult situation. I'd like to say thank you to Mr. Gervais Loembe because we can see that perhaps Europeans have more opportunities for playing a one than Africans, if uh, his promotion is as effective as that. And uh, because he's younger, he's my little brother, I'm going to uh, uh, say to Ngufo that perhaps this is the message to say that there'll be more people playing a wale outside Africa than actually in Africa. Now, perhaps we could ask uh, uh, Professor Mundo, who's uh, the uh, Professor of Philosophy, and he's a, an ex expert on Yoruba uh, culture, to tell us about the different uh, dimensions here, uh, perhaps some points we haven't heard yet, and what the approach is in her, in his, his region, rather. Uh, uh, what's it called? Is it called uh, Ayo or Ajido? Is he there? Je n'ai pas de réponse pour le moment. I don't have an answer for the moment. So now I'll give the floor to the audience. Uh, i.e. the people who are with us uh, since the beginning of the symposium. Is there anyone who would like to take the floor on points which have been discussed? You have to raise your hand or send us a message. You have the hand raise function, which you can do on your screen. Would you like to make comments uh, on something which has been said or there are some points that you would like to add or to stress? This could be um, re directly related to the games, to mathematics, uh, but there's uh, obviously the history and the cultural background of the game, but I'm sure there are some more points that you'd like to add. I can see that there is a hand which has been raised here. Who's, who's raised their hand? I can't see it on the screen. Now, there are two. Now, here. It's uh, Bonaventure, uh, the Ondor who's here. Now, first, two things. We have the impression that things may be moving ahead faster in Europe, but I'd like to point out that there have been very well organized tournaments in, in Libreville and Yaoundé, and I have attended these on a regular uh, basis. And there are prizes, these are large scale events, they're very popular. And I can also give you a bit of my own experience. Uh, now, at my age and stage in life, I play the game with my grandchildren. They're five and 10 years old, and a few who are older. But I teach at uh, Omobongo University, and I've been there for 40 years. I taught as I'd been taught at the University of Bordeaux in France. And I realized that at the end of the year, there were very few students who got on to the next year, otherwise because the program was too high or they didn't have the references or whatever needed. And then I tried to assess their level of mathematics. And I saw that in the first year university, they had a mathematical level, which was about uh, the level of, uh, uh, of a second or third level of high school, junior high school. And so I thought we had to get a tool which would help these students uh, 
not to uh, have to, to go over their basic mathematics, but learn things by uh, games. And I just took this game, which I'd been playing when I was a child, and that's how I managed to link the uh, the game with mathematics. And I started writing about it in paper, papers and um, publishing them, and this uh, led all the way through, and I really went to it in depth. And that's how I ended up with this. Um, I ended up in the first year students in an amphitheater saying to students, don't worry about mathematical logic. We're going to uh, learn it a different way. And we did it with the game. So it's possible. And the real enthusiasm was extraordinary. Uh, usually when uh, we just had uh, um, uh, 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 150 students, we ended up with 500 students because there was something happening because there was this uh, uh, cultural approach to science with demonstrations. And uh, so uh, years later, I published a small book on uh, uh, games involving calculation and I explored all the different uh, aspects of it, the games, the mathematical aspect, and also the social aspect, how you could see this isomorphism between the way the game was played and the way a society lives. And so you could call these chains of solidarity that were organized through that. I think it's important to get that message across, regardless of the situation. And another example that I could uh, give you is a, one day I was with friends at 10,000 kilometers from here, and there was a little girl who was just in a, a, a primary school and was going to get up almost to junior high and uh, had problem with maths. And I said, look, we're going to have a game here. And over the course of the evening, I taught the girl how to play the game, and she became expert at it very quickly. And that basically helped her by going through the, all the questions and answers that a player has to go through when they play the game. She understood the game and all the logic, and that uh, helped to uh, uh, go on. And she really leapt ahead in her in her uh, uh, studies. And she's now a teacher of mathematics. And what's important is to have the game used as a tool for students to learn from the very basic primary levels up to all the higher levels. Thank you very much, Professor Mbeondo. And your experience uh, is uh, as a great advocate of uh, Awale and a great practitioner of Awale. Uh, your call will not go unheard. I can see that Ms. Diop is interested in commenting that, and I know that uh, uh, that uh, Guy Sepahi would also like to speak. He's raised his hand. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to pick up on what the professor just said. I can give you the story of a, a, three, a, a three-year-old child who has my name and who discovered the game at the age of... Uh, of um, uh, three started playing the game at the age of three and got uh, and got uh, fantastic uh, marks in mathematics in his final year of high school. Then went on to do something else. Of course, I have a very subjective appreciation as being my child, but I can also see it from a managerial or political approach to game because this is really a strategic game and it's uh, for sustainable development. So, giving me the opportunity. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to say that. But I'd also like to have a more uh, practical uh, comment on the basis of the nine thousand people. People I've introduced to the game. The great advantage of this game is that it's simple. And it's so simple. People play three or four games and they say, okay, well, I've understood that. I've, and I can going to teach that to someone else. And I've done that in festivals of games where there are three different floors of games. And people say they're going to go on to something else. And uh, they think they think they've mastered the game and they want to do something else. And what I did there, I said uh, to the people who'd done three or four games, and I did a simultaneous game playing three or four or five people at the same time. And usually as I beat them all, that makes them realize that it's simple. It might seem simple, but it depends on your opponent. So that's a trick that I'd like to share with you here. Thank you very much, dear Guy. Now we're coming to the end of this uh, panel discussion. If there are no further comments, uh, of course, you can make more comments tomorrow. 
there's the psychological uh, aspect there. You've got a psycholo psychology, cognitive skills, development of the brain practices. There. And there's a panel discussion tomorrow, which will be dealing with that in a more direct way. I know we had uh, uh, Prince uh, Sergi Gizo who talked about it uh, as a way of, of um, using language, because when you play in your own language, the language says something about the society in question, the culture and the rules of the game. And it's quite entertaining to see what happens in different countries with different African cultures. You you use um, the, you use uh, um, you take use the term to eat when you take uh, the opponent's uh, grains. But time is pressing on, and we're going to reach the conclusions now. We're going to do the conclusions with Ms. Diop. I don't know if she wants to add something before we conclude this first day. Ms. Diop, would you like to speak? No, I don't have much to add. Obviously, I'm very pleased uh, that we were able to organize this symposium because this was something we dreamed about and which has now come true. And I think it's going to be useful from different points of view. I'll talk about that a bit more tomorrow. But I would like to thank you all for being involved. Thank you. And what we can see after hearing the discussions today is that, okay, well, it's a bit frustrating uh, uh, because we can't say uh, anything categorical saying that a wale was invented here and it spread there because uh, it's uh, it's difficult and it's not a major source of research uh, for researchers, even for African researchers. So the, what's behind the question of promoting the game is uh, whether there's a problem of uh, under promotion that uh, even uh, Africans aren't promoting it because it's an African game. Is that the reason people look at intellectual games or they look at things related to sport? And uh, people often start uh, with the colonial experience. They talk about games that were introduced by the colonial forces. Uh, and uh, perhaps uh, we could see that there's a bit of a, a, a cultural movement, uh, a decolonization here. And we can see that African people today are being interested in this uh, knowledge that was there because we can see that these are special areas of, of knowledge. And it's not just a, a minor fun game. And perhaps we do have a change which is gradually emerging. Now we have a, a question which has been sent in via WhatsApp. I was asked to remind you that you can log on tomorrow with the same links that you use today. This uh, is an order which has come from above. Of course, we can't conclude where we've opened the door, we've opened it this up to many people and we would like to thank Présence Africaine for doing this, for going out and finding what might seem like a minor uh, thing, but it's of great, great depth and many things can emerge from it. We saw the experience of Brazil and there's uh, there was a real renaissance there of the game which had disappeared and which is now coming through in institutional way because there's legislation saying that it should be taught as part of the, of the culture of Brazil because there are teachers and researchers, at least we have one researcher here who's on side with us uh, and we should have another one tomorrow. And they're doing work to exhume this uh, culture cultural object is part of the country's cultural heritage. 
so we can also say there's a relationship with science, human sciences, and uh, and proper uh, technical science. It may be popular, it may be lay, uh, and we saw that it could be seen with a sacred import, with uh, a div divining powers. And I think it's essential for us to see this as we have today with the with the multidisciplinary approach. And we had excellent speakers. I would like to thank you all for your work and for your ideas and contributions. So please come back and join us tomorrow. We hope we will have you all here and even more. We're going to continue sowing our seeds. We'll do our own awali with uh, uh, Présence Africaine and UNESCO. So I would like to uh, thank you all, but perhaps Ms. Diop would like to say the final word for the day. Perhaps I could just add a bit to what I said before. I think this symposium will help things move ahead. It's not unusual to, to run into people who play a wale or even to attend tournaments or championships, but what is unusual is to have a symposium on the subject. And unless I'm mistaken, I think at, the, at an international level, as we have here with UNESCO, I think this is the first time we have had an event on Owali at this international level. Oh, what, uh, what I would like, what we would like at uh, Présence Africaine, all the team here at Présence Africaine, what we would like is to have uh, advocacy promoting the game at an official level we would like to talk about it uh, in the media as we do when we talk about championships for the game of chess or for football. And we would like to, to see a multidisciplinary setup being organized around the game. It is a game which has great depth and wealth. It's educational and, of course, it's artistic too, because the difference compared to, to the game of chess or the game of Go, as I see it, is I can't see the same aesthetic effect that you have with a wali. I don't know why, but an awali game is a very beautiful object. You could have exhibitions on it. We could have artistic assessments and presentations of it. There are great resources for the game. And of course, there are the human resources which have been mentioned. As Mr. Sipait pointed out, uh, we know that it's interesting. And we can see that there are rules, and we heard that from other speakers too. We've got rules which are moral rules for, which apply to life. So we have moved ahead today, and I'm sure that the symposium will bear fruit, and we shall continue tomorrow. So thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye to one and all, and we'll see you again tomorrow. <laughs>